Good evening, Mr. Bond fans. You know, reading these John Gardner penned books is like a, such a whiplash inducing experience. I feel like it was not that long ago I was on this channel praising one of his books as a fun, exciting read. And here I am to talk about one of what I would consider to be his absolute worst. So it's probably quite apt that this book, at least I think, has yeah, the worst Bond book title I have ever seen with No Deals Mr. Bond. It's so bland and strikes me as such a last minute choice because there are a variety of other terms and phrases and character names that would have felt more appropriate, maybe. Just as an aside, actually, before we get into the story of the book, I should point out that apparently the title of this one was a bone of contention between John Gardner and his publishers. From what I can gather online, John Gardner put on his own website that he was not a fan of this title, but it could have been worse because other titles that were touted by the publishers included Bond Fights Back and Oh no, Mr. Bond. Gardner's own preferred title was apparently Tomorrow Always Comes, which I can't say I adore, but the man obviously had a better sense of Fleming sounding titles than his publisher. Okay, so here we are with the sixth in the John Gardner Bond continuation series, and the book starts out with a relatively like filmic Bond opening. In the first chapter, 007 is on a mission codenamed Seahawk. Alternative title number one for you right there. He's on a submarine in the Baltic Sea and he's charged with going into Egypt. East Germany to extract two women. It's a very actiony opening and prompts a lot of questions right from the start, like Bond himself is even in the dark as to the exact details behind this assignment. And then after this cold opening, the story jumps forward five years into the next chapter, which is when we start to get more information about what the hell is going on. Bond is summoned to M's Club Blades, and uh, there's a real nice reference in here actually to Fleming's Moonraker, Drax gets a name drop, which I quite liked. Uh, and it's over these next few chapters that that M kind of lays out the plot and basically what the rest of the story is going to be about. The women that Bond extracted from East Germany were part of an Operation Cream Cake, and yes, when I first read that, I did immediately have to go to Urban Dictionary to see if there was indeed a dirty meaning behind that phrase, and I know that with Urban Dictionary you can type in pretty much anything and it'll have some kind of dirty meaning, but this I thought was a genuine dirty thing. I thought it was when a bunch of... has to eat the biscuit, but it turns out that I was completely wrong. Urban Dictionary says it's actually when But fortunately for my delicate sensibilities, neither of those things happen in this particular story. Rather, Operation Cream Cake involved a bunch of agents, mostly female, who were honey traps, infiltrating the KGB and getting close to some of the bigwigs there and reporting back what they learned to MI6. The operation was bungled, which is why Bond had to extract the women in the opening chapter. Now, a couple of the agents have been found murdered and their bodies mutilated. Specifically, they've had their tongues cut out. Just as an aside here, a recurring element of the Gardner books that actually really has been working for me, and I think I might have mentioned this in my last review as well of Nobody Lives Forever, but he has these really, uh, like, gory descriptions of very cruel acts of violence that I think really, I think he paints quite a vivid picture of them, and I think he's got quite a, quite an imagination when it comes to torture and, and these kinds of weird violent acts. There are just some really, like, gnarly details in some of these descriptions that just kind of, oh, like, make you wince, but in, in, in a good way, I think that he has quite a knack for it. I mean, who knows, maybe his true calling would have been a, as a novelist for the Friday the 13th series. Anyway, M wants Bond to find the surviving members of Operation Cream Cake before they meet the same fate. Bond first meets with a woman called Heather Dare in London, and then the pair move on to Ireland to find the next surviving Operation member. Before I get into talking about some of the negatives that I had with this, book, I do want to say right off the bat that I do like that at this point Gardner seems to be very much avoiding the very stereotypical sort of Bond plot of, you know, rich industrialist who has tea with the queen is up to something shifty that Bond has to investigate and then uncovers a world domination plot. With the previous book and this, I feel like his plots are becoming a bit more inventive and doing things that the film series would never have actually done at that time. And this book is releasing in 1987, the same year that Timothy Dalton would become James Bond on cinema screens around the world. So I think it's right for Gardner to be exploring ideas that the films would probably deem a little bit too 
small scale or not global enough. Anyway, to come on to my copious problems with this book, it all very much comes to a halt for me in these middle chapters when they're in Ireland. I think that I think that it is a really good setup, and I'll get talking about the ending soon enough, but all of this stuff that's set in Ireland was just, like, boring me to tears of blood. I guess I'm technically gonna get into spoiler territory talking about the rest of this plot, so this is your warning, I guess. Not that I think that the plot here is anything terribly... Uh, special, but um, this is just so you know. So Bond suspects that a Soviet agent by the name of Colonel Maxim Smolin is behind these grisly murders, and indeed Bond is captured by the guy, what are the chances, in Ireland while he and Heather are looking for a woman called Ebby, who is the other cream cake operative that is still alive. So they're captured by Smolin, but it turns out that he is not actually a villain, but he is in fact a triple agent, and the actual villain of the piece is a General Chernov, who is uh, in the KGB and used to be in Smirsh and has been the brains behind this whole operation to get revenge and killing these people who were involved in Operation Cream Cake. These chapters in Ireland just felt uh, just eternal to me. Uh, there are just so many characters and confounding that further is the fact that pretty much every character in this has an alias or a code name or a different birth name or something that Gardner will just use interchangeably. So I I completely lose track of who's who. So just to give you a little example of this, the main villain, Chernov, his full name is General Konstantin Nikolovich Chernov, but he's also known as Koila Chernov, and his code name is Blackfriar. And these names are used interchangeably throughout the chapters. Like Smolin's code name is Basilisk, and Heather Dare's real name is Irma Wagon. And the the other woman that they pick up is Heb Ebby Heritage, but her real name is Emily Nicholas. And then there's a there's just a dude here called Jungle Baisley, and I can't even remember what that guy did in this story now. And confounding this all further is that there are multiple double agents present in this story. At this point, I just feel like Gardner's Bond is just a really bad judge of character because it feels like in every single one of these stories, there is some double crossing going on. By this point as well, it's just becoming super repetitive and the reveals are all the same. It's always the character revealing themselves, like Bond will turn and they'll be there with a gun pointed at him and they'll be like, haha, you thought I was little Miss Happy Smiles and Rainbows, but I'm actually Miss Evil Witchovich and I'm going to kill you now, Mr. Bond. And then there is inevitably like half a chapter to talk through like the contrivances that it took for Bond to not realize this. Like, you know, he'll, he'll be like, well, wait a minute, if you are little Miss Evil Witchovich, what, how come you saved my life three chapters ago? And then she's like, aha, well, Mr. Bond, you'll find that I had to do that because of this contrived reason. And there are just so many instances of this, it becomes tiring. It's exhausting. And none of it really matters because it's it, at this point it just feels arbitrary. It just feels like the double crossings are here because Gardner feels like he needs to have some kind of a twist in here. But I can barely keep track of these characters as it is. So the fact that Lady Heather Dare or Irma Wagon or whatever she's called turns out to be not whoever she is, is just, I, I don't care, I don't even know who the woman is. I guess my frustrations are really kind of coming from the fact that I don't feel like there is that much plot going on here, like once it gets going, like it's a simple setup, but it's just being complicated and elongated by the switching allegiances and multiple names. Plus, and I mean, this is the same across all of his work, I just never really get much of a sense of the locations in Gardner's work, but particularly in this one, like it's primarily set in Ireland and then it heads over to Hong Kong for the climax. But the descriptions are just so lifeless, I have no doubt that Gardner probably did travel to these locations himself for research, but I'm yet to have him him, like paint a picture in my mind through vivid descriptions uh, the same way that Fleming could do so expertly. Also I felt like there were a lot of asides to spycraft details in this one. I, I don't know how to better explain it but I felt that there was more just terminology and little observations about the mechanics of spy work in this one. I don't know if Gardner had recently read some information or you know whether he was just including here because he felt that he didn't do enough of that like real spy work stuff in the previous book. So anyway, after after a really dull middle section, the thing did pick up a bit for me actually by the end where Bond goes to Hong Kong and he's put in like a most dangerous game kind of scenario, which is another recurring trope in Gardner's work. Like I remember he definitely had that in Roll of Honor. 
I, I can't remember if there was another one. I feel like this might be the third instance of that, where, you know, where Bond is, like, put into the villain's grounds, and there are a bunch of people he's sent off, and then five minutes later, a bunch of other people are sent in to try to kill him. But I actually quite liked all this stuff. Like, it was kind of just silly action sort of stuff, but again, with these violent, you know, descriptions that I felt really worked, and Bond has a few gadgets, the female Q, cute, is still around, she's in this story, uh, and gives him some uh, handy tech. So like I say, Bond is double-crossed in these last few chapters by Heather Dare, who is revealed to be a double agent, and then he's also double-crossed by an Irish guy, an Irish agent, I should say, not just some random Irishman, but he has a few interactions with this guy throughout the book, like over the phone, and this reveal that this guy was in with the Russians, the KGB, is just so hilarious, because it turns out they're sort of like, but why? Why would you do this to me? And he's like, oh, I need money to pay off my gambling debts? And it's like, Jesus, okay, that's the level of motivation that we're at here. But it was definitely a twist too far and added absolutely nothing to this story. Before I wrap this up, I just want to give a shout out to quite possibly the most stupid line I have ever read in any Bond book. This is in a passage uh, in one of the middle chapters where Bond has been taken to this uh, house in Ireland. He's describing the house. He's going to be um, interrogated here. This is the description. The floor was of the same polished pine with a number of thick rugs placed haphazardly around a central oblong carpet. Bond was deeply suspicious of rugs. Have you ever met any other human being who would who would describe their relationship with rugs as being deeply suspicious. Like, yeah, I mean, I know there was that one in Octopussy, but I don't feel like that was enough to scar the man for life. No Deals, Mr. Bond is my least favorite of the Gardner series yet. I found it overwhelmingly dull for the most part, and I'm just sick at this point of Gardner falling back on the double-crossing tropes to try to inject some excitement or intrigue into these stories. I get that at this point he's churning these things out like one a year and you must just, you know, six in. Like maybe you do just run out of ideas or the tropes that, you know, any artist, any author uses throughout their works just become more apparent. And I appreciate that I am reading these in a relatively quick succession now. But I think with the whole double crossing thing, I think that I even liked it in Icebreaker. I think there was a lot of double crossings going on in that one and I felt like it worked a lot better in that one, or at least that's my memory. But it just keeps getting like dafter and dafter and the motivations and the contrivances behind it. And it's not even like the double agents and double crossings were a staple of the Fleming books. I don't know why Gardner has turned this particular element of spy espionage up to 11. I guess he must just feel like it gives the stories an extra layer of intrigue, but for me it's just the opposite. I just get tired of the speculating of like, well, who's the double agent? I don't know, I don't care. And particularly because Bond himself doesn't even figure this stuff out usually. It's only when the double crosser reveals themselves that he realizes. So it just kind of makes him seem like a bit of an effective agent when he's like, oh yeah, I really should have spotted this, shouldn't I? However, you'll be happy to know that my spirits are not dampened. Um, I've seemed to be in kind of like a like, dislike, like, dislike run with the gardeners now, so uh, presumably I will like the one a lot better. It certainly has a more Bondian title, Scorpius, so I'll be rolling right into that one. Please do stay tuned uh, for that review in the near future, and if you have already um, Red Scorpius. Please do let me know in the comment section below whether it's good. Uh, please say it's good. <laughs> Please say it's good. I need to read those words. And also, obviously, below, you can let me know your thoughts on this book. Uh, I always like reading the comments when it comes to the Gardner stories in particular because they're a very, like, niche aspect of uh, James Bond fandom. Uh, and it's great that so many people have read these books and are happy to kind of share their thoughts and talk about them because it's, um, yeah, I find it very interesting. And the Gardner ones in particular, I think, are a real, you, you get some people who have very different favorites and likes and dislikes and all that kind of stuff, which is kind of interesting. It feels slightly less uniform than the attitudes towards the Flemings are, I think. So it's always interesting to hear what people think of 
these. And also below there is of course the subscribe button and the Mrs. Bell notification button so you can stay super up to date on future video uploads that I make on this channel. And as well as those things there are links to my various social media pages down below as well so please do follow me on those platforms if you care to do so. And with all that being said and until next time Bond fans, so long for now. And yeah I did have to do this video without a tie in with my sleeves rolled down because it's bloody hot here in London at the moment.